This week, join me as I travel to Egypt to uncover the real story of one of history's most famous queens, Cleopatra. The legendary beauty who nearly brought the Roman Empire to its knees. But who was this extraordinary woman? How did she come to rule one of the greatest empires of the ancient world? And why did 3,000 years of pharaonic rule come to an end with her death? To find out, I'll search the desert for ancient mummies, dive the depths for ruined palaces, and come face to face with a royal assassin. You go first. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. The Egyptian Cobra, one of the most deadly creatures in the ancient world. The Cobra was both feared and worshipped by the Egyptian people. It symbolized death and immortality. But the Cobra has another claim to fame. Its deadly venom may have brought down the last pharaoh of the ancient world. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. And I've come here to Egypt to learn about the life of the legendary Queen Cleopatra. And what better place to start than face to face with her dramatic death? According to legend, Cleopatra committed suicide by allowing a poisonous snake to bite her. If the story is true, the snake in question would probably have been this one the Egyptian cobra. This is how much? 200 milligrams. 100 milligrams. 100 milligrams, yes. And this would kill how many people? Five people. Five people? Five people, yes. So now, sir, if this were to bite me, how long before I'm dead? One hour. One hour? One hour. And this is the snake that killed Cleopatra? That is a story. Okay. And that's the problem. We think we know a lot about Cleopatra because her story has been told and retold for centuries by historians and by Hollywood. The most enduring version of the myth comes from an ancient historian named Plutarch. He writes of a beautiful and ruthless queen. To satisfy her lust for power, his Cleopatra seduces the greatest leaders of the Roman Empire. At a time when Egypt and Rome are locked in an epic struggle for supremacy, her affairs rock the ancient world. But how much of what we know about the legendary queen is actually true? You have to realize that Cleopatra's history was written by her enemies, her Roman conquerors. So it's going to take a little bit of work to separate facts from fiction. My quest begins in the port city of Alexandria, on the north coast of Egypt. 2,000 years ago, this was Egypt's capital, the seat of Cleopatra's rule. I'm heading straight for the world's most famous library, the Library of Alexandria. Tragically, the ancient building and all its contents were destroyed centuries ago. Which means the history of Cleopatra, as written by her own scholars, is lost to us forever. But there may be another source. I'm meeting Egyptian historian Dr. Okasha El Dali to find out more. This has got to be the coolest library I've ever seen. This is the modern library of Alexandria. And it houses a very special collection of ancient manuscripts. Our treasures are all here. Okasha has been analyzing the medieval Arabic texts. Long ignored by Western scholars, they've provided him with a radically different portrait of the Egyptian queen. Let me start with the Roman perspective. How is she portrayed by her Roman contemporaries? They didn't like her, they were afraid of her power. In fact, the Romans portrayed Cleopatra as a coquettish seductress, committed to conquering Rome and ruling the world. You're saying that these manuscripts portray a different perspective? Absolutely. 
What do they say? Well, a lot of these Arabic manuscripts are complimentary about her ability as a leader, but most importantly, they portray her as a great scientist. There is not one single mention whatsoever to her sexuality or even her physical appearance. Although these texts were written long after Cleopatra's time, they draw upon lost papyri and documents written by her own scholars. This account, written in 900 AD, is typical. She was a great philosopher, um, appreciated the company of scholars, and wrote several books on medicine, cosmetics, and other branches of wisdom. How is it then that the Romans portrayed her as this beautiful seductress, and yet in the Arab texts, she's a very well-respected intellectual? Well, two reasons. The Romans would have hated even the idea of a powerful woman, while the Arabs were more accustomed to a very powerful woman in their middle as rulers, queens, ah. so they would not have been threatened by an able woman like Cleopatra in the way the Romans were. I still have to ask, was she a beautiful woman? Well, come with me and you can decide for yourself. Wow, okay. Okasha has brought me to the Greco-Roman Museum, where he says I can actually meet the real Cleopatra. Okay, we are sure, or almost positively sure, that this is Cleopatra the Seventh, our famous queen. Ah, we meet, finally. This Cleopatra is hardly the beautiful woman Hollywood has made her out to be. But Okasha, how do we know that this is Cleopatra? Well, with most of the royal statues of the period, we are not 100% sure whether this is so-and-so or not. Mm -hmm. However, because of the similarity of this to her well-known and documented coins, we can be positively sure this is Cleopatra the Sevens, and we can go and look at the coins, and you can judge for yourself. We've been granted special permission to enter the museum's vault. Here, coins minted in ancient Egypt are kept under strict lock and key. Okash is taking me to see a series of coins minted under Cleopatra's reign. All these coins are from the Ptolemaic times? All of them, from Ptolemy the first to all the way to Cleopatra. Ah, wow, look at these. So these, all these coins have her face on them, huh? Yes, seven of them. Yeah. Not all of them are very well preserved, as you can see. But the last two ones here are mm -hmm. better preserved. Oh yeah, there she is, right there. Yeah, and I can see how like this image looks very similar to the statue we just saw. Yes. And you're saying that this was an approved image of her. She would have seen this. Normally, royal coinage would have been approved by the palace or representative of the queen or the monarch. And in this case, Cleopatra is highly likely to have approved this herself. Well, looking at it, she's not unattractive. This is turning into quite the mystery. Clearly, there are two conflicting histories of Cleopatra. To find out which one is real, I need to know more about her life, her dynasty, and the empire she ruled. I'm in Egypt, trying to uncover the truth about the real Cleopatra. So far, I've discovered two competing portraits of the Egyptian queen. One is from ancient Roman sources. A beautiful woman who uses charm instead of armies to capture the hearts of Caesar and Mark Antony. The other, found in ancient Arab texts, portrays her as a brilliant ruler a philosopher and scientist. That's, that's a very different picture than what the Romans are saying. Absolutely. To get to the bottom of this mystery, I'm going to need to learn more about Cleopatra and her dynasty. And I know just where to go. This is the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It's home to the largest collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts in the world. I'm meeting an old friend here, Dr. Zahi Hawass, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. Dr. Zahi. If anyone can put me on the trail of the real Cleopatra, it's Zahi. Dr. Zahi, how are you? Good to see you again. Great to see you. You look great. Thank you. Where's the hat? You'll see it later. Ah, very okay. good. It's Cleopatra Let's this time, Let's go and yeah? see some stuff about Cleopatra now. Okay. The most important thing about Cleopatra Josh that she was not Egyptian, she was Greek. 
So how is it that a Greek woman became so powerful here in Egypt? Started from Alexander the Great came to Egypt in 332 BC and established Alexander. Zahi tells me it was Alexander the Great who established Greek supremacy in Egypt. After his death, his commander, Ptolemy, became the first Greek pharaoh. His descendants ruled for the next 300 years. This room houses artwork from the period. For the Ptolemaic dynasty to have successfully come and ruled in Egypt, <clears throat> what kind of cultural changes would they have gone through? First of all, they did something very smart. They tried to combine the Egyptian gods mm -hmm. with the Greek gods. Number two, if you look at the temples, completely Egyptians, they did not build uh, Greek temples. They built Egyptian temples because they are ruling in Egypt. Everything in here is Instead of imposing Greek values and traditions on this ancient civilization, Cleopatra's dynasty worked to secure their position by becoming Egyptian themselves. The Greek became Egyptians. Look, this is a pharaoh. He's not Egyptian. Wow. And look at his face. Yeah, the hair. It's uh, Greek, but the nimbus yeah. is the Egyptian headdress. The style of the body is Egyptian. The skirt is Egyptian. And that really is one of the best examples to show how the Ptolemaic, when they lived in Egypt, were Egyptianized. If the Greek are ad adapting so much of Egyptian culture during their lives, what about during death? Josh, I think the best is I take Shakara, and I will have a surprise there. But let us change the suit now okay. and wear your uniform and okay. my hat, and yeah. we'll go there. Grab your hat and we'll okay. go. <laughs> Saqqara is an hour drive across the sands from modern-day Cairo. It's a cemetery, or necropolis. For centuries, ancient Egyptians, rich or poor, were brought here for burial. Back in Saqqara. Zahi tells me a team of Polish archaeologists is excavating a new site here. What they're uncovering may tell us a lot about the Ptolemaic period. There are human remains everywhere. It's definitely a child. Yeah, someone. Because so many of the graves belong to young children, archaeologists believe an epidemic must have swept the region. The graves, though, are unmarked and crude. And with no obvious decorations or artifacts, it's hard to date them. What we need is a well preserved adult mummy. That would give us our best shot at linking this site directly to Cleopatra and the Ptolemaic dynasty. This is an exciting opportunity to be present during the uncovering of a mummy. It has to be done carefully. These scraps of linen and fragments of bone are fragile clues to the past. It's painstaking work. And finding something intact is the exception, not the rule. As I quickly discover. It's not in a good condition. But you don't want to Grave robbers have beaten us to the prize. But even, even the At some point during the last 2,000 years, the body that lay here was disinterred and destroyed. Whatever clues were buried with it vanished long ago. Like so many graves at Saqqara, looters looking for treasure ravaged the tomb. With all the respect, this makes what Zahi is taking me to see next all the more precious. In 2005, one of his excavation teams made the find of a lifetime. It was buried unmarked just below the surface in this very place. A 2,300-year-old wooden sarcophagus, dating from the Ptolemaic dynasty. Remarkable enough, but when they opened the casket... That's it. Wow. This is the most beautiful mummy ever found in Egypt. So how do you know that this is Ptolemaic? Uh, first of all, the, the face with the mask. 
This is a typical mosque that started on uh, the beginning of the Ptolemaic period. Okay. And after that, the condition of the mummy is also looks uh, Greek. And this uh, inscription with the color, it occurred only at the beginning of the Greek period. And this is one of the this mummy confirms that Cleopatra's ancestors gave up their Greek burial traditions in favor of Egyptian rites. Period like this mummy. But why would the Greeks lose their culture? They found out. For us to live as an Egyptian, we have to be Egyptianized. And we have to die like an Egyptian. We have to have the uniform, the hieroglyphic, and the most important thing, in my opinion, they adopt the Egyptian belief of the afterlife. This tells us a lot about Cleopatra's dynasty. But to get to know the real Cleopatra, I'm going to need more than just a beautiful mummy. Zahi tells me Cleopatra's dynasty built a series of temples dedicated to Egyptian gods in southern Egypt. Perhaps I can learn more about Cleopatra there, and even get another glimpse of the queen herself. I'm leaving Cairo and heading south into the heart of Egypt. Well, I'm now in Upper Egypt. And one thing I love about the Egyptians, they really know how to make an entrance. I've come to the Temple of Edfu, built by Cleopatra's forefathers in the second century BC. I'm hoping it can tell me about Cleopatra and the world she ruled. But I'll need a little help reading the writing on the wall. Dr. Mamdu? Hi, Hi, Josh. That's why I've asked Egyptologist Dr. Mamdu El Damadi to show me around. He can help me decipher the hieroglyphs. It's a beautiful place. Huh? It's a very beautiful place. Wow. And one of the most important temples from the Ptolemaic time. What was it that the Ptolemaic... Mamdu tells me religion was extremely important in ancient Egypt. And the Ptolemies used this to win over their Egyptian subjects. This temple is a prime example. Edfu was built to honor the falcon-headed god, Horus. The ancient Egyptians believed their pharaohs were the physical manifestation of Horus on Earth. By allying themselves with Horus, the Ptolemies were saying they too were gods. And as gods, they had the right to rule over the Egyptian people. Edfu was also the place where Egyptian priests recorded their most important historical events and traditions, right on the walls. Mamdu wants to show me a particularly interesting inscription. They're recording everything on the walls. Yes, and look here. One which suggests that the Ptolemaic strategy for winning over the people didn't always work. These texts tell us about a rebellion. And not just a minor rebellion. This one lasted through the reign of two pharaohs, from 205 to 186 BC. Wow, so this donkey says rebellion. And was it common for a rebellion to occur? Yes, it's common. It was yeah, common? Yeah, of King Ptolemy. These hieroglyphs show us there were sporadic Egyptian attempts to overthrow their Greek rulers. Look. Here, when we have a representation of a king, mm -hmm. we have always the two cartouches of the king. Pastor, this name tells you who that is. Yes. When the rebellion started, they stopped the work. They was here. They were here by this cartouche. And they stopped the work and left a place here beside this cartouche. Empty. Oh, because of the rebellion, they didn't know who would win. That's sure. Because maybe the king in Alexandria, maybe the rebellion in And they did that up there too, huh? They it's didn't even put a cartouche it's at all. the same, yeah. And since they Mamdu explains that the Ptolemaic position was precarious. They were here by this cartoon. Bottom line, they were foreign rulers occupying a proud and ancient civilization. There was a constant threat of rebellion. So when Cleopatra comes into power, she too has to manage this risk. The people could turn against her. She had to do that. Now I'm getting somewhere. This gives me a sense of the pressures that the pharaoh Cleopatra would have faced. Still, this is the temple of her forefathers. It's time to get closer to Cleopatra herself. I'm trying to go beyond the myth to get to the real Cleopatra. She was the last of a dynasty of Greek rulers who adopted the traditions of the Egyptian pharaohs to win over the people. 
But at the temple of Edfu, I discovered that there were sometimes violent attempts to oust them from power. Wow, so this says rebellion occurred? Yes, it's a common. It was yeah, common. Yeah. But I still haven't learned much about Cleopatra herself. What kind of a ruler was she? And how did she manage the threats against her throne? Dr. Mamdu El Damadi is taking me on a journey to find out. We're leaving Edfu and traveling 70 miles along the Nile to a temple that Cleopatra built called Dendara. Okay. To get there, we're taking a traditional boat called a felucca. It's a relaxing way to travel. And it gives Mamdu a chance to fill me in on Cleopatra's early history. To Cleopatra. Cleopatra. Yes. Ah, tell me, what do you want to know about Cleopatra? Well, we've we've talked about her family in the Ptolemaic dynasty. Yeah. Why don't we start with Cleopatra and when she actually took over? Cleopatra was young, sharp, smart, intelligent. Cleopatra was just 18 years old when she became queen. At the same time, the mighty Roman Empire was marching through the known world. Rome's armies controlled nearly two million square miles of territory, from Western Europe to Asia Minor. The driving force behind the empire was the 52-year-old Julius Caesar, the most powerful man of his time. Cleopatra had to win Caesar's support if she was to keep her throne, and that's exactly what she did. Her meeting with Julius Caesar is one of the most enduring stories in the Cleopatra legend. It's 49 BC. Caesar is in Egypt to collect on a loan. Wrapped in a carpet, Cleopatra smuggles herself into Caesar's inner chamber. And in one night, she wins over the leader of the known world. And the man himself. The result of the relationship is a child named Caesarian. He is Caesar's first and only son. So it's, wait, a 21-year-old girl uh, yes. smuggled herself into the bedchamber of yeah. the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. That actually happened? Exactly. Nobody knows. But it is sure happened a relationship between them. It's a cunning political move. At 21, Cleopatra has negotiated a major international alliance with the one man capable of securing her throne. But how did the young queen learn to pull off such a bold plan? Wow. It's beautiful, yeah? Yeah. This is Dandara. Yeah. She came to the... Mamdu tells me part of the answer can be found at our next destination. The Temple of Dandara. Yes. It is, uh... Work on the main building was begun in the time of Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII. This way. We go down. And Mamdu wants to take me somewhere Salam special. Down there. Yes, Makeda. The crypt. Mumkin, uh, Shukran. This is this is great. <laughs> wow. Tight squeeze. Yeah. Look at this scene here. This is why we're here. This is Cleopatra's father, King Ptolemy XII. I'm now eye to eye with Cleopatra's father. And chances are, the young queen herself once walked these hallways. The last year, it was the co-regents between, uh, with his daughter, Cleopatra. Really, they were co-regents? Yes. So they were ruling together for how long? For one year. For one year. The last year of his reign. Cleopatra was being groomed to be a pharaoh. And she learned how to be a pharaoh, but she did she, better than him. She did better than him. She learned well, huh? Yeah. Mamdu explains Cleopatra became genuinely popular with the Egyptian people. The key to her success may well have been her astute understanding of the Egyptian language and religion. Cleopatra represented herself in the form of Isis. By portraying herself as the most popular goddess in the ancient world, Cleopatra won over her people. Also, she was the only queen who learned the ancient Egyptian language, the only Ptolemaic queen. So she had political power as the pharaoh, regardless. But the fact that she had the people behind her gave her an additional source of power in the country. Yes. By absorbing the lessons of 300 years of Ptolemaic rule, Cleopatra learned to master the art of public relations. 
But while Cleopatra had won over her people and the Roman Emperor, resentment towards Julius Caesar and the Egyptian Queen was festering in Rome. The year is 44 BC. Suddenly, the situation explodes. Caesar is assassinated. He's stabbed to death on the steps of the Senate in Rome. We'll never know if the young queen mourned the loss of a lover or an ally. But one clue at Dendara suggests her ambition to rule the world remained intact. They really decorated everything in this temple. It's a piece of propaganda commissioned by Cleopatra herself. Mondo, tell me, yeah, is, what is this all about? It is the main scene of Cleopatra and his son, her son Caesarian. Cleopatra is shown standing behind the son she bore by Caesar, Caesarian, declaring him the future ruler of all of Egypt. And not only the pharaoh, the god, the, the god king of Egypt. It's a public declaration. Caesarian is the son of Julius Caesar and his rightful heir. Sounds like I need to go to Alexandria. You have to go to Alexandria. Cleopatra could have laid low after Caesar's death. Instead, she laid claim through her son to the combined empires of Egypt and Rome. This was one ambitious lady. So why did it all end in suicide? To find out, I need to go to Cleopatra's capital city, Alexandria. I'm in Egypt, following in the footsteps of Queen Cleopatra to uncover the truth behind the legend. I've discovered she was a skilled ruler. She learned the language of her subjects. She adopted their religious beliefs. And her own propaganda tells us Cleopatra was a highly ambitious woman, determined to manipulate Rome and make herself the most powerful queen in the ancient world. Now it's time to get to the heart of Cleopatra's empire and find out how it all fell apart. I'm traveling back to Alexandria, the seat of Cleopatra's dynasty in Egypt. From Cairo, it's about a two hour train ride. So it's a good time for me to do a little more research. After Caesar's murder, Rome was plunged into crisis. Two men seized power and divided the empire. Octavian, Caesar's proclaimed heir, was given control of the western provinces. And Mark Antony, Caesar's loyal commander, got the eastern domains. Cleopatra, meanwhile, was left without an ally. Caesar's will made no mention of his Egyptian son, Caesarian. Without Roman support, her hold on Egypt and her greater ambitions would be doomed. Once again, the Cleopatra legend tells of a dramatic seduction. Having lost her protector, Caesar, the now 25-year-old queen makes a play for Mark Antony. She stages a dramatic meeting and they fall in love. The truth may be far less romantic. Cleopatra needs Antony to protect her interests against the expanding Roman Empire. But Antony has an agenda of his own. The young soldier is a good-looking and popular leader, but his position in Rome depends on his ability to win wars for the empire. And for that, he needs money. Cleopatra is a very powerful queen, ruling from one of the wealthiest cities in the Mediterranean world. This is Alexandria. It was the capital of the Ptolemaic dynasty and the center of Cleopatra's power. Founded along the Mediterranean in 332 BC by Alexander the Great himself, it was one of the largest and most influential cities of its time. It was the New York of the ancient world, a prosperous center for international trade and shipping. So the palace of a PR-savvy queen like Cleopatra must have been spectacular. But finding the evidence isn't going to be easy. 
Over the past 2,000 years, much of the ancient metropolis has disappeared beneath a modern city of 5 million people. But I've heard there's an archaeologist who can help me. He spent decades uncovering ancient Alexandria, deep below the streets of the modern city. An entrance to the underworld of Alexandria with a staircase. Pretty cool. I'm looking for Dr. Jean-Yves Ampereur of the French Center for Alexandrian Studies. This is his current project. These ancient caverns are part of an extensive underwater storage system that was designed and built by the Ptolemaic dynasty. Hello. Hello. Ah, doctor. Uh, nice to meet you. Welcome. Where did this water come from? From the Nile River. So when the Nile floods, yes, it flows exactly. over into from the, the, system, the canal into the and filling the system. Johnny tells me a vast network of cisterns spreads out beneath the city. In Cleopatra's time, it provided the population of Alexandria with enough fresh water for a year. If all these cisterns were full of water, how many people could be living in Alexandria? Oh, we think its population was about half a million. Half a million people? It was the biggest city in the Mediterranean. Wow, and they all drank this water? Half a million. By ancient standards, that's huge about the same size as Rome at the time. This shifts my perspective on Cleopatra. Her capital wasn't just opulent, it rivaled Rome. Cleopatra was more than a distracting seductress in the eyes of the Romans. She was a threat. These cisterns are evidence of the world Cleopatra inherited. But I'm looking for the palace she oh, built herself. Some, uh, heavy and John Eve knows where it is. He has a series of 18th century maps that he believes pinpoint her palace. So, see some map. So, John Eve, where is Cleopatra's palace? We are here. Yeah. And so part of them are underwater. I had it all of this get underwater. There was a big earthquake which happened in, on the 25th. 1st of July, 365 A.D. An earthquake? Yes, a big earthquake. I hear. So an earthquake destroyed the palace in the 4th century A.D. So it's uh, very muddy. But considering the monumental scale in which Cleopatra did things, there's a good chance something remains. So if I want to find it, I'm going to have to get wet. Yes. And I have to find the right guys to help me. Exactly. And I know just who I'm going to call. It just so happens that two of the world's leading underwater explorers are here in Alexandria. John Chatterton and Richie Kohler. My friends, the deep sea detectives. These guys are always up for a challenge. Well, we got everything set up with the dive shop. Okay. And uh, all you got to do is give us a little more information on exactly where it is you want to dive. I do have a general sense of where in the harbor I want to dive, mm -hmm. but I would defer to your expertise to show me how we're going to do that. The deep sea detectives are here to find the remains of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Pharaoh's lighthouse. But they've agreed to help me find Cleopatra's palace first. This is cool. John and Richie are the very best at what they do. It was, this was, had been the center, the capital of the Ptolemaic dynasty. So for 300 years. The Alexandria Harbor is a designated archaeological site. Diving is strictly controlled. But the Supreme Council of Antiquities has given us the go-ahead. Over the years, a series of excavations has taken place. Enough has been found to convince archaeologists that the palace is here. So we're starting in this area of the harbor? Yes. Yeah? Makes sense? Yeah. And then once we get a, a sense of what's actually down there, we'll come back up, regroup, and do a better second dive. Is that right? Let's Perfect. go dive. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. All right. We've been warned that time and nature have destroyed much of what lies below the surface. But we could get lucky. Thanks, buddy. No, no, no. It's the moment of truth. Let's do it, man. Cleopatra was one of the greatest pharaohs of ancient Egypt. It's time to see what's left of her legacy. 
I'm on the trail of the real Cleopatra of Egypt. So far, I've discovered an intelligent, ambitious queen who ruled a thriving empire that rivaled Rome. So why did it all come crashing down? How did 3,000 years of pharaonic rule come to an end with her death? I've come to Alexandria, her ruling capital, hoping to learn more from her royal palace. But there's a problem. In 365 AD, most of Cleopatra's legacy was destroyed by a massive earthquake. Anything left is now beneath the water, deep in the harbor of Alexandria. To see it, I'll have to get wet. So I'm teaming up with John Chatterton and Richie Kohler, the deep sea detectives, to help me get to the bottom of this mystery. Out of there. The first few moments are discouraging. The water is a turbid brown soup, full of sediment. Gosh, can you hear me? This is John. Yeah, I can hear you, John. We were expecting poor visibility, but this is really dark and murky. Once we're below the first five feet, though, the water gets a little better. Soon, we see a lot of man-made objects covered in sediment and algae. No, Josh, it's hard to determine what are artifacts and what is the natural seafloor. Thousands of years of ocean sediment cover the surface of everything down here. Then something attracts Richie's attention. Wait a second for the silt to clear and you can see that this is a pathway. Our first landmark. We'd been told that there was a white stone walkway that led to Cleopatra's palace. These could have been the very steps that Cleopatra walked on. The area is full of enormous slabs of limestone and granite. It's hard to tell if this is part of the ancient palace, but these broken pillars certainly look the part. It's just beautiful pottery. Look at the quality of the pottery here. This pottery and the pillars are amazing to see. But I want to find a more tangible clue. Something that dates back to Cleopatra herself. And just then, lying on the sandy seabed, we see a familiar shape. Come here, come here! Come here, there's something very cool over here! The stone head may be worn smooth, but the body is unmistakable. This looks like a, this looks like a sphinx. Oh, wow, look at this side. You can see the rib cage and everything. This is awesome. In ancient Egypt, the Sphinx kept watch over pyramids, tombs, and temples. It takes a bit of imagination, but this Sphinx may have stood guard at the gates of Cleopatra's own palace. Right now, we could be in what was Cleopatra's palace. But it looks like we're centuries too late. The destructive power of the ocean has erased any clues left by the queen herself. Still, I've seen enough to think that just maybe we're swimming through history. That was really impressive. That was a good one. Oh, that was a good one. Without moving really any of the sand, you were able to locate all those amphorae. There was broken pottery everywhere you looked. Yeah, and it's, it's frustrating. I wanted to touch it and actually <laughs> wanted to bring it up here and look at it more carefully. We, we've had very few experiences where we've been able to uh, dive and see artifacts that were that old. And we so. could have been literally just like this close to something that Cleopatra touched. Oh, oh, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Time and nature destroyed the legacy of Cleopatra. But what caused her downfall? In the end, Cleopatra herself remained silent. The only accounts left to us are those written by Roman historians. In their version of events, Cleopatra is becoming increasingly dangerous to Rome. 
Not only has she subverted its golden boy, Mark Antony, but her son by Caesar is a potential challenger to Roman authority. In short, Cleopatra is a threat to the Republic. And in 32 BC, Rome declares war. Now Egypt is caught in the middle of a power struggle for Rome. On one side, Antony and Cleopatra. On the other, Octavian, Caesar's proclaimed successor. In 31 BC, just off the coast of Actium, Greece, their two fleets come together in a decisive naval battle. Antony and Cleopatra are utterly defeated. They retreat to Alexandria. There, Antony takes his own life in disgrace. Okasha El Dali meets me by a broken statue of Mark Antony, a final legacy. But for the great queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, there's even less to see. In the catacombs of Alexandria, however, Okasha tells me I can get a sense of the last pharaoh's final hours. He believes it was in a mausoleum, much like this, that Cleopatra ended her days. So how did things end for Cleopatra? Well, according to the Roman legend, she retreated back to her own mausoleum in the city. And after such a glorious history, she couldn't mentally face the dilemma of having to be taken prisoner and trophy to Rome and displayed in the streets. And according to the legend, she committed suicide. With her ambitions to rule the world crushed and her lover Mark Antony dead, Cleopatra takes her own life too. It's her final act of defiance. Did she actually die by snake bites? Yes, well, we're not quite sure if this was the case. There's a very interesting element here because cobra is a divine aspect of Egyptian religion. And for the queen to meet her death at the hands of such a divine creature is part of that myth. She chose a symbolic death, a lasting testament that would mark the end of an age. Rome decided never again will we allow an Egyptian threat to our authority and influence in this part of the world. And with the death of Cleopatra, 3,000 years of pharaonic rule came to an end in Egypt. Absolutely. Never to be seen again. Never to be seen again. I'm just curious, so what do you think would have happened if Cleopatra had won? If Cleopatra and Mark Antony had won, the world would have been very different. And if she had won, then the image that we have of her today would have been very different. Well. Absolutely. She would have been portrayed as a dedicated, uh, intellectual, uh, powerful leader who united the world rather than divided it. It's been a fascinating journey. <laughs> wow. We've sifted through the evidence and gone beyond the legend to discover an extraordinarily cunning and powerful ruler. Queen Cleopatra of Egypt was an ambitious woman, willing to risk it all to make Egypt the center of the ancient world. And in the end, that's what brought her down. Cleopatra was the last of the pharaohs, but she found immortality too. Not in the Great Pyramids of Giza, or in the tombs of the Valley of the Kings, but in legends that will endure the sands of time.